talking about three Cather novels in particular. And I'm going to talk about them not in their usual order, which is to say the, the order in which they were written. I'm going to start talking about My Antonia, which is 1918, and is generally considered Cather's finest, though sometimes there's debate. And then I'm going to talk about O Pioneers, which is 1913, and one of her first, or among her earliest. And then I'm going to talk about <coughs> Song of the Lark, which is 1915. But before that, I want to talk a little bit about Cather in Nebraska and even before that. So Cather is born in 1883 in Back Creek, Virginia. And I need to get my notes on this because I forget all my dates. Cather was born in 1883 or 1884 or 1885 or 1886. It depends on which point in your life, in her life, they asked her. So as she aged, she seemed to get born at a different date. But we're pretty sure it's 1883, which is, I believe, not what's on her tombstone. Um, but, you know, a girl gets to lie if a girl wants to. Um, when she was nine, the entire family moved to Nebraska, probably because her father was not a particularly clever businessman. He was a good businessman, but he didn't make much money, and the family was large. And in moving to Nebraska, he was able to move into sort of the support system of his family. And within a year, the family had moved to Red Cloud, Nebraska. Um, Cather, having been born in 18, I'm sorry, 1873, I want to tell you that the year after Cather was born was the first exhibition of Impressionism at the Jeux de Palme in Paris. Just to kind of give you a global sense, the year after she was born, Edison invented the electric light. When she was three, the Sioux and the Cheyenne defeated Custer at the Battle of Little Bighorn. So, you know, there's quite a global and a local history to fit this woman into, who's born seven years after the end of the Civil War who lives through World War I and World War II and dies in 1947. So she's got a long history and a lot of events are happening throughout the world, including the invention of the simple brownie camera, which Cather became in love with, to put it mildly. <clears throat> That's why I don't want to get up there. Um, when the family moved to Red Cloud, Nebraska, there was not much there. Indeed, there isn't much there today either. Um, but what there was there is indicative of a certain time and part of the country. There was a post office, because all small Midwestern towns had post offices. There was a library, because all small Midwestern towns had libraries. And there was an opera house. Why was there an opera house in Red Cloud, Nebraska, that still has the original cobblestone streets? And not much else. There was an opera house because it was an area with a very large, as much of the Midwest was, it was an area with a very large German immigrant population. And we know from historical work that's done that when Germans moved into various parts of the Midwest, they took up collections to build opera houses because music was really important. So even though the area was heavily farmers, there was nonetheless this, what we would today think of as high cultural interest in opera. And of course, then in, in stage dramas of various sorts. And indeed, Red Cloud, Nebraska, which is quite a ways from Lincoln. It's a long train ride. Became a stop for traveling theater groups. So while Red Cloud has nothing and nowhere to be at the same time and has there things that a clever child, a curious child, could interest herself in. There was culture. There were books. And equally important, there was an extremely strong, large, active group of immigrants from Europe. 
And one of the things that's most stunning about Cather as an artist is that she in every way wants to name herself not as an American artist, not as a woman artist, as author. Because who she loves and who she reads is not American. It's European. She reads in German, she reads in French. And she thinks that these writers are the best there is, and that's who she wants to be. But she also believes very strongly that where good art comes from is from memory. And her memories are American. So she's got a kind of an interesting, I want to say in a, in a way, an interesting conceptual problem or identity problem, as my students would like to say. Her real self doesn't know to hew to the European and classical tradition or to turn to a much yet to be fully developed American tradition of literature. I mean, it's certainly a time in American education when American literature is not taught because it is assumed there is none. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got a cold, so I'm going to have to keep clearing my throat. It will not come as a surprise if I tell you that Cather, when she goes to college, moves to Lincoln, Nebraska, and majors in classics. In what? Classics. So she moves to Lincoln, and the first thing she does is she starts reading in Latin and Greek. And she, she has a facility for languages. She's reading in German at that point, and she's also reading in French. Is she reading American authors? Not so far as we can tell. What she is doing that seems highly American is she's become the opera and theater reviewer for the Lincoln Papers. Now she's 17 years old and she's mean as a snake. Okay? She is so mean that there's a point at which some of the traveling companies say they're not coming through anymore. They don't need those kinds of reviews in, for heaven's sakes, Red Cloud Nebraska newspapers, of which there were two. And the kinds of things she says are, well, I bet they would have done that better in New York. <laughs> so what she's not willing to put up with is second rate. She wants first rate. She's not going to get it in Red Cloud. Cather moves to Lincoln, goes to school, gets her degree, goes to Europe for the first time on a, about a three-week trip, comes back, works in a variety of Lincoln newspapers and magazines, none of them particularly stunning, and ultimately gets a job as a teacher of Latin and English literature, which is really at that point English grammar, in a school in Pittsburgh. So she moves to Pittsburgh, and with that move, she will never again live in the Midwest or even the West. She has left the plains of America behind her. From Pittsburgh, she get, in Pittsburgh, she teaches for several years, and she gets an and is trying to publish. She's trying to write a little bit. She meets Sarah Orne Jewett. Jewett tries to help her get a little polish of which she has little, maybe none. And ultimately she gets a job at a magazine that would be the equivalent today of something like The New Yorker in its popularity and in the broad variety of things that it covers. It's McClure's magazine. And she's there another seven years working as editor. <clears throat> and it's there that she meets a number of American artists and it's Sarah Orne Jewett who ultimately confronts her and says, you are spending all of your energy on other people's literature. You can't do that. If you really want to be an artist, give it up now. And she does. Catherine becomes a writer full-time, making what extra money she needs by doing reviews. She never stopped writing journalism all of her life. And she never stopped reviewing opera or drama, but she deferred opera. And 
the other thing I will tell you before I really get into the novels is that when Cather is an editor at, on a magazine in Pittsburgh, <coughs> the journal, the magazine is called Ladies Home Companion, and they don't have much money, and they can't pay authors. So Cather writes most of the magazine herself under a variety of names. Um, and we're only now beginning to figure out how much of the magazine she really wrote under names like Bertha Livingston on child care, of which she knows nothing. <laughs> well, maybe that's unfair. She's the oldest of five, and she took care of her younger siblings. But one thinks, probably not enough to write that column. Anyway, I've now got her in New York, and that's where she will live. She will make trips to various places. She's always crossing the country. It's the age of trains. She goes back to Nebraska to visit parents. She goes to the Southwest to visit her, her brother, who is next to her in age. She goes to California to visit. She has many friends there. She comes back to New York. She goes back. She's making four and five trips a year, not to mention going to Europe at least once a year for as much as three months. So she's very, very traveling all the time. And much of that travel is across the continent. She has a sense, I want to say, of American geography. When she's in New England at Jaffray Inn, she writes by hand outside. Outside. She does all of her writing in a tent. Um, whenever she can, she walks. Before she writes, comes back and writes, walks again, comes back and writes. So there's a sense of her as someone who, who kind of needs to trans, transport herself across a geography. When My Antonia begins, it starts with a young boy named Jim Burden, and he has many burdens, on a train leaving Virginia to come to Nebraska to live with his grandparents because he has been orphaned. As he's on the train, and he's nine years old, gosh, where have I heard somebody who was nine years old on a train to Nebraska before? Hmm. But she says, everything good in literature comes from memory. The boy looks around him and he sees that the car of the, of the train is filled with immigrants. This is not what he had in mind. Because what he's reading is one of these little dreadful cowboy novels, worse than Zane Grey, in which bandits come wearing masks, the hero has a large white mustache and a silver pistol. They are chased by Indians, they chase prairie dogs. Everyone is a hero. And of course, what the people on the train have no resemblance to this kind of romanticized West. He gets off the train to meet his grandparents' helpers, the ranch hands he likes to think of them as. They're farmers. And the men who meet him do not look anything like the pistoleros and the banditos who he had so hoped to meet from his romanticized book. They're kind of Everyday guys, one of them doesn't speak English as well. He's slightly, he has a heavy German accent, Otto. They're, they are not romantic. Moreover, getting off the train with him is a family of immigrants who speak no English whatsoever. The women are wearing babushkas. This is not the American West of any John Ford movie we've ever seen. This is the West that Cather grew up in, and it is the West of her memories. But it is the absolutely non-romanticized West. Jim gets in the cart that the two farmhands are going to use to take him to his grandmother's house, and he looks around and he panics. There is nothing to be seen. There are no trees, there are no buildings, there are no lights. All there is is the sky and the stars as far as he can see it, and he feels as if he has fallen off the map of the world. 
that he is nowhere. And it's terrifying. In fact, he is so nowhere that he can't even imagine his parents in heaven looking down on him because he is in so map, unmapped a place that they could never find him. So it's a kind of a heathenish vision that Jim has. He is outside the land of civilization. And he falls asleep. And when he wakes up, he wakes up with a woman bending over him and saying, you look so much like your father at his age, lying in this room. And of course, it's his grandmother, and she's a little teary because he does look like his father. And Jim is in a small white room whose walls are not solidly plastered, but have been adobe, more or less, so that the walls are uneven, as they would be when human hands pat them, and then they're whitewashed. And behind his head is a small window flapping, and it's hard not to see this as a moment of birth into this new unmapped land. And indeed, it continues, that, that kind of motif continues. Grandmother takes him by the hand and says, come downstairs into the kitchen, which is where the kitchen is located. He thinks it's very strange to have to go down into a kitchen. He gets there and grandmother says, you're dirty from the train, take a bath. So Jim takes a bath behind the stove in a bucket of, uh, or a, you know, a good sized tub of, of warm water and washes himself clean and he's baptized, I want to say. He has breakfast. He's happy with the food. And grandmother says, I'm going to go out to the garden now. Gardens, OK. You might want to meet me there, but be careful of snakes. I don't mind snakes, she says. They're, they're nice company, actually. A body can get kind of lonely out here. But keep an eye out. And so Jim walks out to meet her. And at first, he can see nothing. He cannot see his grandmother. What he sees is a thicket of vegetation. He sees squashes, he sees pumpkins, he sees leaves. And then finally, he sees grandmother. And he putters along beside her for a while. And then he sits down against a large, it must be a very large pumpkin, and half asleep, watching little doodle bugs in the and the soil around him. Half of sleep, he thinks, so this is what death would be like. This lovely moment in which the sun shines and I am warm and enwrapped in it. A moment when Jim feels he is dissolved into something truly great. And of course, it's nature. And so in, in just one chapter, I want to say, Catherine takes Jim from a moment when, orphaned, he experiences himself as having, as being nowhere, as entering into no man's land, has him born there, has him baptized there, and then has him die there, happily. I want to say, in the embrace of a pumpkin. That moment, I think, is quintessential for thinking about how Cather starts to understand the meaning of art making. And I'm sorry to say it because she'd hate me in America. The kind of twinning, the kind of entwining or braiding of the civilized self with nature. Not in any corny way, isn't it lovely, but in a much more basic way. I'm going to die, and it will be a good death if I can be with, let's say, the pumpkins. Now I'm going to make a little leap from that. I'm going to tell you that the family that got off the train with Jim turns out to be 
Antonia's family, or Antonia's family. I don't know how to pronounce it either. Um, everybody I have ever heard pronounce it says my Antonia. Catherine tells us it has to be my Antonia, but nobody ever says that. Now I'm so confused, I don't know what I say. So you'll hear both pronunciations come out of my mouth. <clears throat> it is Antonia's family. And of course, the book is called My Antonia, right? Well, who is writing it? Jim. When is he writing it? He's writing it much after the fact. He's writing it when he is a fully adult male. He's become a train person. He does something with the trains. He's unhappily married, not to Antonia. And he goes back to visit her. He goes back to find her, and he does. And there she is, it's 25, 30 years later. She has married a man named Anton. I won't take that on here. And she has maybe 15, 18 children. It's the age before the pill. But that's not the point. She has to have this many children. She has no teeth. Her skin is brown and leathery and wrinkled. And he looks at her and he says, you are as beautiful as you always were. So he sees the Antonia of the past. Antonia says, let's go get some nice things for dinner. Children, you know where the preserves are kept in the root cellar. Get some of them. The children go in to get the preserves. And Jim turns around from talking with Antonia, and they come bursting out of the root cellar, all of them, tumbling and pushing one another and laughing and singing and making a heck of a lot of noise. And it is that moment when we realize the novel began with nothing unmapped and nowhere. And now it's ending with this moment of incredible fruitfulness that if there is an artist here, it's Antonia. But she doesn't get to tell her own story, which is maybe why she's toothless. Jim tells her story. It's Jim's memory of Antonia, not Antonia's memory of herself or of Jim, that writes the tale. We know this from the beginning, and we forget it by the end. So it's a complicated novel insofar as we come to think that the, the artist that Cather best imagines is, is the artist of reproduction, of an incredibly multiparious female body that just keeps turning those babies out. Their bursting from that root cellar is very like Jim being born out of his grandmother's kitchen. On the other hand, that, that sounds to me always like, oh, come on. 23 children and no teeth, and that's what you have to be to be an artist? Give me a break. But it isn't true, because there's Jim who writes the story. And is it true, the story? Well, I don't know. Is that the story Antonia would tell? Probably not. She'd probably have a very different story. So the artist's memories are what get told, but the truth, not necessarily. And we have to kind of realize that there's an odd balancing act here. Is it Jim who records the story that we are reading? Or is it Antonia, who we don't know a thing about from the time she meets Anton until now? Toothless, heavily tanned, withered, and all those children who is the artist. It's a hard one to answer. Because if we look to the novel that I want to look to next, O Pioneers, we find here that the artist is a farmer. And that the same sense that art is about reproduction is carried out 
agriculturally. What makes her an artist? She produces so much wheat. She loves the land. She makes it work when everybody around her is selling their land because they can't grow anything. She's out there learning the latest stuff from agricultural journals and buying all the land as fast as she can do it. This heroine is the artist because, again, of reproductive ability. But let me take you back to the first part of the novel. I think it's going to sound familiar to you. Checking time. Okay. The novel opens in a small town in Nebraska where a, lo a young girl, a young boy, and a smaller child, who is the, woman's, the, the young girl's brother, have come to do some errands. The little boy's cat has gone up a tree, actually a, lamp po a light post, and the older boy goes up and catches the kitten and puts it in a basket, and they get into the cart because it's getting dark and there's clearly bad weather coming on, and they start home. And as that cart moves out, Katha writes that it moves out into a land that wasn't a land at all. It wasn't even a country yet. It couldn't be called anything. It was without any human monument upon the land. Just as we saw Jim sense in that, that carriage, in the cart that's taking him to his grandmother's, here too. The sense that Cather gives us is of something so barren that it's hard to even call it a country. She says the land is illegible. It's a book that hasn't been written yet, she says. And who's going to write that book? Well, not Jim Burton. That was the wrong novel. He's done with it. This is a different person who's going to write that novel. It's going to be a farmer. It's going to be the young girl in that cart. And indeed, it's a sad trip home, not only because the land is so rough and it's so cold and the wind is coming up, but because Alexandra, and that is her name, think Alex, think tough, strong warrior girl, is going home to a father who is dying, a mother who hates living here, and two brothers who could care less about the farm and would be very happy to sell it immediately. And her father extracts from her a promise which she's only too happy to give, that she will not sell the farm. Even though he says, I've, I've been here 17 years, I have broke myself trying to make something come, and I have nothing to give you but the land that's not doing much. Your brothers don't care about it. Your mother hates it. Don't sell it. And she doesn't. There is tension because the brothers think that if anybody should have been given their father's will to make the land work, it should have been them, even though they hate it. And that's the end of book one, and book two begins 17 years later. And the land is legible because it is covered with wheat farms, and they're all Antonias. Everything is growing. The young boy who had been with her in that cart, Carl, has gone off to try and make a living in New York as a, well, not an artist. What he does is make lithographs of other men's art for the newspaper. So he gets a picture, he cuts and etches in stone and wood that picture, and then it can be printed on the page. He's not an artist, he's a copier. When he returns to the land to see Alexandra, who is never married, who has had many painful things happen in her life, when he returns to the Midwest, to see, him, to see Alexandra, he looks around and he says, you're the real artist, not me. And she's shocked to think that what she's done is, as she says, to write the land, W-R-I-T-E. And yet, 
because it is now legible, she clearly is the writer. And Carl, who has copied pictures, who has failed at Alaskan mining, who has failed at almost everything he's done, will now marry Alexandra. And at that point, my students rebel. How can they get married, they say. They've never kissed one another. Moreover, no one ever talks about romance. No one talks about love. No one talks about sex, for God's sake. She's marrying her brother. This is terrible. This is awful. Why is it ending this way? <laughs> well, of course, it's, it's, it's not about love and romance or sexuality. All of that is what Aunt Alexandra already has with the wheat fields. That's where her reproductivity, her erotic life, if you will, her creativity is to be found. And she marries Carl because she says, it's really so nice to marry someone who's such an old friend. That's a good thing. And my student here goes, oh, God. Um, so now I'm going to put that novel to the side and pick up a third. And I'm going to use this, this third novel to kind of pull some things together. Even though I'm not going in order, what I'm trying to do, I'm not going in publication order, but what I'm trying to do is pull together what I've come to see as a pattern in Cather that you can only see when you do it backwards, which sort of makes sense. That as she wrote more, she, got the, she figured out what she was thinking about. And so with the earlier novels, we see her still, I want to say, scratching her head just a little bit and trying, trying to get it, though I think she always got something really very right. Um, <clears throat> so now I'm going to look at Song of the Lark, which is Cather's longest novel. Um, many people think that's terrible, it's too long, that it goes on at such length. Her publisher tried to make her cut it. She could only cut something like 250 words. Um, I personally like its length because I never wanted the novel to end. But I warn you, if you haven't read it and you're thinking about it, it's long. <clears throat> and you have to like opera. Um, because The Song of the Lark is about a woman who does indeed become an opera singer. But the title is not about the opera singer, whose name is Thea, T-H-E-A. The title is taken from a very second-rate oil painting that hangs in the Art Institute of Chicago that Cather saw herself on a Chicago trip, and that she has Taya see when one day she's very depressed because her career is going nowhere. And she goes to the Art Institute. She sees all these wonderful casts of Roman and Greek warriors and gods. And she thinks they're noble and handsome and lovely and energetic. And then she sees this picture and she says, yes, yes. She keeps going back to visit that picture. The picture is of a young girl standing in a field, her feet deeply entrenched in the earth. And she's looking up because a lark is rising in the dawning sky. It's not a great picture. It's really not. And I used to be able to show you the picture, but it was destroyed, I'm sorry to say. And I, because it's a second-rate picture, I've had a hard time finding another copy of it. Um, but Taya is utterly taken with this picture. You're not surprised, because you know that farmers are artists. What's interesting here is that it is the farmer who gives the artist, who is what we would really think of as an artist, an opera singer, the thing she needs to keep going. What she needs to keep going is to see that picture and realize, and I'll be going backwards in a few minutes, to see that picture and realize when she looks at it and feels so good that she feels good because it reminds her of her past her memories, what was real, what actually happened once. She looks at some other pictures and she sees a picture of a heifer. And she loves that picture of the heifer because she says, that's just like our heifer. 
So there's something about, that's being made very clear here, I think, about the way that the land, nature, in some way is the thing that the artist has to recognize and recognize as having a place in, in this case, her own past. <clears throat> so let me go back to the beginning for a moment. It will not surprise you if I tell you that Taya is a young girl living in, yes, a Midwestern town, this time it's Colorado. Not very far removed, actually, from Nebraska. And that Taya is born in an immigrant family. She is the oldest of six. And that she early learns that she can make some money for herself by giving piano lessons. And her mother is quite happy to let her take piano lessons. And her father, who is a minister, is quite happy because he uses her to do the music for Sunday sermons. He uses her in the choir. He makes a lot of use of her. She's very handy. <laughs> Over time, Taya becomes more and more entranced with her music making. She takes lessons from a variety of people, but perhaps the most famous is Professor Wunsch, which, W-U-N-S-C-H, which means wish or desire. And he's got a little problem with the bottle and is much shunned by most of the good women of Moonstone. But Taya's mother is a very practical woman, and she says, you know, if he didn't drink, we couldn't afford him. <laughs> He's the best there is, so some days he doesn't smell so good. Don't sit so close. And so Taya gets really very good lessons, but she's getting those lessons from a European. And that will continue. What is she playing. Well, it's not American ballads that she's playing. She's playing European music. And she's teaching it to little American children who hate piano lessons as much as any stereotypical child is supposed to hate piano lessons. Over time, it's decided that Taya will go to Chicago and study piano to become a concert pianist. She goes there. She finds a music master who is Hungarian. And to make a little extra money, she sings in the Swedish church, just as she sang in her father's Swedish church. But she doesn't do so well as a pianist. No matter how hard her piano master works with her, he says there's something terribly missing. She's technically excellent, and something else isn't there. One day he goes to meet her at her Swedish church and he hears her singing. And he says, stop the piano. This is what you should be doing. And she says, oh no, I'm just singing a bunch of old Swedish songs I've been singing you know, since I was three years old. He says, no, 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 no. That's it. So it is the familiar, memoried music of the past, but it's not American music. It's being sung in Swedish. That is the thing that allows the Hungarian piano master to recognize the talent. She now gets herself a variety of music teachers for the voice, none of them except the really bad guy who's kind of a charlatan is American. So she studies with Europeans. Moreover, as she starts to give concerts, it's recognized this woman has no polish whatsoever. And she is brought to a Jewish family, the Nathan Myers, who have come out of Russia and whose home is, they're very, very, very rich. They kind of underwrite much of the cultural activities that have to do with music at the time. And they take Taya in, and they teach her how to use a fork. They teach her how to dress better, how to stand better. They teach her to speak clearly. They have her read books, European books. And ultimately, she becomes the kind of person who can walk into concert halls and sing. 
because of the tutelage of non-Americans. So here we have Cather imagining the artist in America completely trained in non, by, non by non American standards, by non American teachers to sing non American things. Her interests in music run to Wagner. And indeed, that will become her fame. She'll become a great Wagnerian singer. But she becomes depressed because she thinks this whole art world thing is kind of a sham. That people who don't sing very well, but are kind of ritzy get ahead, that glitz means more than real talent, that it's all in who you know. And she's thinking of getting out of the opera business. Maybe she should just become a piano teacher again. She has an opportunity to go to the Southwest, and so she goes to what's now Chaco Canyon and the Pueblos there. And she literally lives in them. She has friends who, who own property in the area. They let her go. Nobody's thinking about this sort of thing at the time. And she lives there for three months, living inside one of the stone houses, bathing in a pool nearby, and starting to regenerate, walking the canyons, climbing various parts of these housing units, for lack of a better word, and one day she realizes she's been there a long time. She's been there three months. And she's never noticed that all around her are pieces of pottery, broken pottery, lots of it. And that every single pottery shard is decorated. And she thinks, OK, the women had to make pottery to get the water to carry it back to their home because it's a long walk, and how are you going to carry water? But what they didn't have to do was decorate it. That takes time. Why did they decorate it? Why didn't they just make the pot? But somehow this notion of the earthenware pot, whose use is absolutely practical, also being the thing that becomes an art object. She starts looking at more and more shards. She starts kind of lining them up and noticing all their different patterns. She thinks there's something here that the mundane, the trivial, the everyday becomes the thing that is made beautiful. Moreover, she keeps thinking about these women carrying these pots carrying them. She says the smart ones made good-sized pots, so they didn't have to make so many trips up and down. And that the pot became, the water became the shape of the pot. She thinks about that a lot. She looks at the pool near her doorway. And she thinks about how the water takes on the shape of the small depression that it's in. And she thinks about her own throat and how it is the vessel for her voice. And that there isn't much difference, she comes to think, between the earthenware pot that holds the water necessary for life and her own throat that holds the song, the breath, that is necessary for her life. And it's at that moment that Taya realizes she's not going to give up. She's going to go to Europe, she's going to train there, and she's going to become an opera star or die. The next time we see her <clears throat> is on a stage, singing a role that is long and loud and Wagnerian. And then we see her about an hour later. The opera has ended. She's off the stage, she's taken off her makeup, she's put on a large cloak with a hood, <clears throat> and she meets an old friend. <clears throat> and he looks at her and he thinks, my God, she looks 80 years old. You should know. 
what 80 looks like. He thinks, she looked magnificent on that stage and she looks empty now, hollowed out. Hard not to think of pots. That she spent her water. And now she is the empty pot who has to wait to be filled again with, I suppose, her own energy and spirit and music and artistry before she will again be alive. And that's sort of where I want to leave it with those three novels. I can pull in other novels, but I think that is the, the overall, the overarching pattern that Cather plays with in all of the novels. That very interesting way in which the past and nature themselves are entwined, in which the past and nature are the thing when they are able to regenerate, make someone an artist, whether that regeneration is vocal or wheat or children, or the funny way in which Jim creates a novel but is no artist. And I'll, I'll let you ask questions if you have questions. I promise not to give a quiz. <laughs> yes? I'm still way back in the small town. Oh, um, how did she learn French and German in this small town? Um, I'm going to presume two things. One is that she did some of that German study and French study in college, but she did it beforehand because there were people in town who spoke those languages. And she was, she was a gadabout. She didn't stay home a lot. She was, she traveled all her life and so far as I can tell as a, a younger woman, say in her teens, she walked all around. She knew everybody. She's got a lot of stories. So I think that's how. She didn't learn Swedish, so far as we can tell. And she appears not to have learned Italian, though she was an opera. One would think somebody who was interested in opera might want to learn Italian. But she loved France, France and she loved French culture in general. Um, and she loved German operas. I don't know more than that. Cather's early years are not particularly available to us. Um, she, if she had a diary, she destroyed it. She destroyed most of the letters she could get her hands on, of her letters and letters to her. She burned them, thousands of them. Yeah. So the women in the, in the uh, novels are unusual in the sense that they're independent and they're not worried all the time about their children or their marriage or whatever. So where does she fit in? Is she one of the women in the first women's movement? Or is she a totally made up character because she's Willa? It's a, it's a great question. The question is, where does she fit in? Um, I can't say it as well as you said it. Uh, she's, is she one of the women in her novels? Is she sort of a mask? Who is she? Who is this woman? Um, Catherine is pretty adamant that she's not a woman. She doesn't want to be a woman because women write drivel and she doesn't write drivel. But I think there's more to it than that. She doesn't want to be a woman because she doesn't want to get married. She doesn't want to have children. Because if you have children, you do not become an artist. You are not Antonia. You lose your teeth and nobody writes a story about you. Was she a lesbian? Probably. But it's not a word that exists early in her life. It only comes into being as a word later in her life. Um, Freud writes the interpretation of dreams in, I think it's 1899, so when she's in her 20s. Um, she made her own way. She's one of the few women we can point to in American literature one of the few people we can point to in American literature who made a living from her writing. I mean, everybody else was a doctor, or an insurance claims adjuster, or a custom officer, or you name it. But she decided in her late 30s that she was going to 
give her life to Arden. That's what she did. I do think that what we see in the novels is a real skittishness around romantic love. It's not that it's not there. It's there in many of the short stories, and it's always a disaster. It doesn't do good things for people. So the best loves are those like Antonia and Jim Burden. There is no romantic love involved. Or like Antonia herself, who marries somebody who's just like her, Anton. She marries her male twin. OK. Sounds like fun to me. Um, or someone like Alexandra, who lives all of her life quite independently, and then marries her best friend sort of towards the end of things. I think Catherine is very skittish about marriage. Her male characters who marry, marry unhappily. You cannot find happy marriages. In fact, I would say the happiest marriage in any Catherine novel is between the two priests in Death Comes for the Archbishop. And even that doesn't last all their lives because the one priest decides that what he has to do is go join sort of the, the, the poor people of, of the Mexican area, of, of the New Mexico area. And the other priest has become an archbishop. So she's hands off. If you want to write, don't have children. Well, I think she feels that if she's considered American, it's too diminishing that the great authors have all been European. Um, and that's what she wants to be, as a great author. She didn't want to be the first American great author. No, that wasn't enough. She has big ambitions. I mean, she writes 12 novels. I'm trying to think if there's another woman author who's written that many who is a great author as opposed to, say, people who I might like to read but who I would not call a great author. Edna Ferber. I like Edna Ferber. I like Rumor Godin. They've written a lot of novels, but I don't think that they're great authors, and I think Kaffer is a great novelist. Um, <clears throat> it is odd that somebody who is so associated with American literature and more with the American Plains is somebody who herself says, look, memory is the most important thing you work with as an artist, and I'm not an American writer. Come on, Willa. Can we get real here? But it's hard not to be. I, I don't take her side on this, but I understand her. Um, <clears throat> You know, is it true that all women writers were writers of drivel at that point? No way. Catherine Ann Porter is no writer of drivel. And Catherine Ann Porter knows Catherine, and Catherine knows her, and she doesn't want to have much to do with Catherine Ann Porter. Sarah Orange Hewitt, who was dearly beloved by her and whose um, short stories she edits. And, and I want to say misuses. She puts together Country the Pointed Furs, as Sarah Orange Hewitt did not. She makes it bigger. Why? Because she thinks that heft will give Sarah Orange Hewitt, Ju Sarah Orange Hewitt more literary worth and fame. So part of me wants to say, boy, if you're a female author, don't let Gather get her hands on your work. God knows what will happen. Um, she knows other. She knows other Americans. She, she's very fond of Stephen Crane. Fondest of him when he's dead. Uh, she knew him when he was young and writing for the magazine she edited. She knows Hemingway. She doesn't particularly like him. She knows F. Scott Fitzgerald. She doesn't like him either. She liked Lawrence for a while, but mm, that didn't last. She thought he was dreadful. Um, she called his novels smut. She liked them originally, but after they had a falling out, he went down the drain. 
So she knows authors, American authors, who are really, really good. Mm-mm. No. No one will, will match up to the great French writers, the great German writers. Perhaps in a funny way, by turning her face so firmly to European culture, Catherine is making a defensive move. You can't compare me to any Americans. I'm not. Don't even think of it. Oh, you haven't read all of these French authors in French? <laughs> you are lost. I, 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 I may be really wrong there, but she is so ambitious, and she is so very, very modern in her understanding of self-image and packaging that I don't always trust her good instincts. I think she's, she's up to something. <laughs> yes? I don't think she, I don't think her opinions about literature were much given, except in private. Her opera and theater reviews, in fact, were given attention. So it's almost as if when she works out of her field, that's where she has some kind of authority. She did a three-part series on um, American women opera singers that I know is still used as an example of, of how you go about setting up comparison contrast between individuals. It's used, it gets used in English classes from time to time. Um, but it's a nice piece of writing. So she was never, she did not write reviews of books. Whether she was asked and turned down this, we don't know. Maybe, maybe not. It is now. It is now. Five after. If you have more questions, I'm happy to answer them, or I will let you go be driven mad by the presidential debate. <laughs> Thank you. You were, you were a great audience.